series in Psalms, as has been mentioned. We've called it mixtape. Uh, you remember those mixtapes? I think we've kind of illustrated the concept enough over the last few weeks. Uh, but the idea is that it's kind of like God's mixtape. The Psalms is kind of like God's mixtape of a bunch of songs and prayers for us to sing along to, pray along to in any season of our life. Um, prayers that, that model for us how to pray to God. Um, and today uh, we are uh, on Psalm 19. And uh, you guys have shared a lot about uh, what lyrics have been really impactful on you and some of your favorite lyrics. Um, on that topic, by the way, the band this morning was epic. Um, and I don't know if it was just me. I, I sort of felt like maybe I had like an inside view of things because I, I was preparing on Psalm 19. And then the band like just had a beautiful alignment of all the songs to the psalm. Uh, and so maybe the lesson is for you to find out what the sermon's going to be on, find out what the <laughs> text is, and spend like a week or two meditating on it, because then the songs just come alive um, on Sunday morning. It was, it was really amazing. Uh, so thanks to the band. Um, many of you probably have heard of C.S. Lewis, the, the well-known Christian author, also the author of the Narnia series. Um, Amen. Uh, amen. Um, amen to that. Um, I'll take that as an amen. Um, the Narnia series. Um, here's what C.S. Lewis said about Psalm 19. C.S. Lewis said, for him, it is the greatest psalm. It's a big claim in itself. It's the greatest psalm and one of the greatest lyrics of all time. So that's a massive claim. Um, I certainly can't complain about the text that I've been given today. Um, so with that anticipation bolt, let's get straight into it and let's read it together. Um, Psalm 19, it should be up behind me. I'm going to be reading from the NIV version. So let's read together. Psalm 19, it's for the director of music, a Psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray and ask God to help us as we spend time in this psalm. Father God, we pray as we sang earlier today that you would reveal yourself to us. We pray that by your spirit, you would speak to us in your word. Would you teach us also how to respond to you, Lord? That as you reveal yourself to us, help us to respond in repentance, in worship, and in trusting you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One way of defining religion or thinking about religion that some people use is to see religion as man's search for God. Man's search for God. I wonder what you think of that definition. 
I don't like it too much, and I don't think it's terribly biblical in terms of what Christianity is about, because as we'll see in Psalm 19, God has taken the initiative and he has revealed himself to us. And if anything, we have rejected him and ignored him. So God has revealed himself, and we'll also see in the psalm how an appropriate response to God looks, how to respond to him. So as we unpack the psalm, let's first ob observe a few things about its structure. It has three sections. Um, I've color-coded them there, three sections that, that I think are quite easy to distinguish. Uh, firstly, because they have clear themes. So the first section is clearly about God revealing himself in creation. Uh, the second section is about his word, how he's revealed himself in his word. And then the third section at the end is about our appropriate response, or David models an appropriate response to God's revelation of himself. So there's clear themes, three clear themes through the psalm, but also the translators have helped us by putting kind of spaces in between, because this is poetry, and although we don't read the original Hebrew poetry, the translators try using different kinds of spacing and indents and things to give us a feel for the underlying poetic structure of the psalm. So with those clues, um, spoiler alert, those are the three sections. That's kind of the structure for, for today. Uh, we're gonna see God revealing himself in his creation, God revealing himself in his word, and then our appropriate response to his revelation. It's, it's really a big meditation on those two ways, two really key ways in which God has revealed himself, in his creation and through his word. Someone has put it this way, that we have God's world book out there. Unfortunately, the, the curtains are shut. But out there, we have God's world book. And he's also given us his word book in the Bible, the world book and the word book. And another, maybe more theological way of framing it is that God has given us his general revelation in creation and his special revelation in his words. So general revelation and special revelation in his word. And so we start off in the first section of the psalm with David contemplating and singing a hymn of praise to God for his uh, general revelation in creation. And we read in verses one to four, let me read them again. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Notice all the speaking words highlighted there for you. There's a lot of speaking words. Um, there's declaring, proclaiming, speech, revealing knowledge, voice and words. Uh, clearly, uh, creation is saying something. Creation is speaking very, very clearly. And the next thing I want you to notice in these, in these verses is the parallelism. Um, this is a, a very common thing in Hebrew poetry, parallelism. So what it, if we look at, say, verse 1, what we see is that the two lines say something almost the same, but in a slightly different way. Um, so, the, so the heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. And then day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. So there's this symmetry, this parallelism, where they're saying almost the same thing. Now, why is that useful to notice? Um, partly because it's just kind of cool, like we can nerd out a little bit on, on the poetry aspect of it. But also, it kind of helps guide us in terms of meaning. When we see structural, issue, structural things like that, it helps guide how we should interpret it. So, for instance, we shouldn't go and overinterpret um, what, the, what the skies are doing relative to what the heavens are doing. You know, it's not as if um, the heavens are declaring God's glory and the skies are doing something else, namely proclaiming the work of his hands. Uh, it's not as if like day, day after day is pouring forth speech and the nights are revealing knowledge as if that's something kind of slightly different. Um, if, we, if we read it that way, we could overinterpret things and kind of come up with something like about the day that's kind of different to the night in what it's saying. But this is a poet, it's a poem. So it's kind of saying uh, one thing. It's, it's basically telling us that God is speaking constantly through creation, revealing himself, revealing things about himself. But obviously God is a creative genius, so he's chosen to give us his word and he's chosen to use things like poetry so that we can use our imagination 
and, ex and see it in different ways and get a feel for it rather than merely as kind of a theological truth about God speaks through creation. All right, so, so we should really get into the kind of poetic feel and beauty of, of what creation is doing here. Um, I love that phrase, day after day, pause forth speech. Day after day, pause forth speech. The, the image that I think it conjures up is of like a powerful gushing river or a waterfall kind of coming over the top pushed forward by an immense force of momentum behind it, going on and on and on. Um, and that's what creation is doing. It's just pouring forth speech all the time about who God is. Um, the sun itself is pouring forth speech. Just think about the sun, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a bit of time on the sun in today's sermon. We're going to binge a little on the sun. Um, we won't take it too far. We're not going to end up worshiping the sun. But... <laughs> The sun, the sun is, is, is pouring forth speech constantly. Um, I read up about it a little bit, and apparently the sun emits uh, a lot of photons every second. It emits 10 to the 45, to the power of 45 photons every second. So 10 to the power of 2, 10 squared is 100, 10 cubed is 1,000. So 10 to the 45 is a very big number <laughs> of photons. It's an enormous number um, of photons. Um, what is a photon, you ask? Oh, sorry? A particle of energy. A pocket of energy. I didn't know that. I was about to say I'm not glad you asked, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we have an answer, so I appreciate that. We, it's, a, it's a pocket of energy. The sun is emitting 10 to the 45 pockets of energy every second. Every second. And apparently only about one billionth of them reach the earth. Uh, only about one in a billion hit the earth. The rest go out into the universe. And that one billionth powers everything on earth. All of life is dependent on the energy, the pockets of energy that we receive from the sun. Human life, plant life, everything, it, all the energy contained in the earth, uh, solar panels <laughs> and many other things are powered by that one billionth um, of photons that reaches the earth. And I, th I think that speaks of God's, like, just his endless riches, his extravagance in creation. Um, it definitely says something. Yeah. And that's just the sun. That's just the sun, which is one average-sized star. And any guesses as to how many stars there are in the universe? Maybe not guesses. Any, maybe someone's counted. <laughs> <laughs> A thousand. We have a thousand from Siamo. I've got a thousand. I've got one thousand. Do I have ten thousand? I've got a thousand. Apparently, astronomers estimate that the universe could contain up to one septillion stars. <laughs> one septillion. <laughs> Guys, I never heard of a septillion until I read that. Apparently, it has 24 zeros. Okay, so it's a lot of stars. It's a number with 24 zeros at the end. That's how many stars there are in the universe. And the sun is just one of them. And God brings out these septillion stars one by one, calling them each by name, as we sang earlier and as Isaiah wrote. And because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. That's prop. <laughs> Guys... I can go full Louis Giglio on you, if, if, if you want. I can go full Louis Giglio on you. Do you guys remember Louis Giglio? Yes. The indescribable series. Remember those videos? They, there was like a cult 30 years ago, right? <laughs> but a good, a good kind of cult. It was, it wasn't, it was, it was legit. Um, but Louis Giglio, yeah, he had so many pictures and photos, and that was almost 30 years ago. I think we've got so much more now with the latest telescopes and things that they've put up, put up there. But Louis Giglio really understood this message of Psalm 19. He understood that creation is saying something, and he helped communicate that to us and make us look at it. Um, one quote from Louis Giglio in this, in this series that, that I'd like us to read. Um, Louis Giglio writes, The heavens are telling the glory of God. And their expanse declares the work of his hands. Night after night, they remind us of just how small we are and how huge God is. Looking out into the far reaches of the universe, 
we find a seemingly infinite expanse of mystery and wonder, intricately fashioned by a God of unfathomable size and power. See, Louis Giglio understood that the beauty of creation reflects its artist. And the magnificent design reflects a magnificent designer. It absolutely does. That is the message. And there are, I think we, we need to get the message right, but I want us to be aware that there's also ways of misinterpreting the message. There are ways in which people look at creation, look at the universe, and get it somewhat wrong. Um, one way is reading the stars, right? We know about astrology, reading the stars, reading too much into it, like what's going to happen this month, depending on when you were born and what your star sign is. Okay, that's maybe not the way. We, that's not the right message. Um, another wrong message or ways of getting the message slightly wrong that even within kind of versions of Christianity we, we can do is either to undervalue creation somewhat or to overvalue creation somewhat. Um, so undervaluing creation would, would sort of rely on a view of God that he's a bit outside his creation. Like maybe he created things, but he kind of left it, and he doesn't, he's not like intimately involved anymore. Um, that, and, and if you undervalue creation, you may not care for creation enough. You might not be good stewards. There could be implications of that view. On the other hand, we could overvalue creation, as a lot of modern and ancient religions have done, where you end up worshiping creation, or worshiping the sun, or, see, or, or believing that God is kind of, cre creation is God, like he's in everything, and, and, and that's, what, that's who divinity is, is kind of in everything. Um, but that's not quite right, and, and the Christian view of things is, it, it kind of gets the, the balance just right, um, or the tension just right, where God is both imminent in creation and transcendent, standing above creation. So he is intimately involved. He hasn't kind of left it alone um, and let us be. He, he is intimately involved. The word says he sustains all things by his powerful word. And the word says that in him we live and move and have our being. Um, but he also is transcendent above creation. He also stands apart from it, above it, sovereign over it. He created it. He will outlast it in its current form. Um, so God is both imminent and transcendent, and we shouldn't fall into the trap of undervaluing or worshiping creation itself. All right. What about the message from science? Do you think science gives us the right message about creation? Or is there a risk of science contradicting the Bible? To be honest, this is, this is a difficult question, um, and it probably deserves an entire lechotla. Um, I, I would recommend a chapter in this book by Tim Keller, Reason for God. There's a great chapter on science and has science disproved Christianity and religion. Very helpful chapter. Um, and just to kind of quote one, one thing from that chapter, um, where it writes that the, the conclusion is ultimately that there is no necessary conflict between Christian belief in a creator and scientific explorations of the way in which, at a biological level, God has gone about his creating process. Okay, no necessary conflict between believing in a creator and scientific explorations about the biological mechanisms for how God has created everything. All right, and if you, if you don't like Tim Keller, let me give you a quote by a South African theologian, Jonathan Tudhope, um, <laughs> affectionately known to us as Pastor Jono. Um, and he says, I love it when science catches up with the Bible. All right, that's what he, he has said from this pulpit. Um, but let me explain it in another way, um, using a different illustration. So I think in the kitchen at the back there, if not already, sometime soon, we're going to be boiling some water. Some water is going to be boiling in, and I'm not sure if it's a, I think it's a coffee machine slash urn slash kettle, something along those lines. And the question that I have for you is, why is that kettle boiling? Or why is that urn or coffee machine boiling the water? Now, one answer to that question is, uh, that inside the urn or inside the, the machine, there is a metal coil, and electrical energy is traveling through the coil, and it's turning into heat, and it's heating the water in that urn. That's one answer. Another answer is that Sanele decided that we need coffee and tea after the service. 
he decided we need to boil the water. Now, both of those are correct answers. They're not in competition with each other. They're just different categories. They're different types of answers to the question. So I think that science and Christian belief is kind of operating the same way. Like the Bible's not trying to be a textbook and explain you know, electrical coils and things like that. Um, but it is telling us that there is a creator behind everything. Um, and actually, as we explore science, it's just, it's just kind of like discovering what God has done. It's just discovering his beauty. And, and I think it should turn us to, to wonder and worship um, rather, than to, we should, no, rather than being scared of it or, or scared that it will cause us to doubt or something like that. Now, uh, one big question that scientists naturally ask um, is when they look at the universe, is how did it all begin? That's an obvious question to ask. Now, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna try something today which has not been done before, um, and perhaps for good reason, and we're about to find out if, <laughs> if there's a good reason for it. I wanna try and explain the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> All right, nervous, nervous laughter. I want to try and explain the Big Bang Theory. Now, before I explain it, I, 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 do, I have like a few caveats I need to make. One is it's just a theory. Even within mainstream science, it's a theory. It's not like proved. Um, it's a theory, but it is quite mainstream. Um, but then from a Christian point of view, um, I think my understanding is that at Rooted, we don't take a hard stance on, where, on, on the whole old earth theory versus a new earth view of the world. So. Within Christian, within sort of fairly mainstream Christianity, some people believe in a new earth. In other words, that the earth was created maybe somewhere like 10,000 years ago, uh, using, and God did it in six literal 24-hour days. Um, and then other people believe in an old earth, which is somewhat more aligned to kind of mainstream science, that perhaps the earth is millions of years old, maybe even billions of years old, um, and then the universe is really, really old. And the Big Bang Theory would fit into that kind of, of view of things. Um, so with that caveat in mind that I'm not saying, like, the Bible certainly doesn't tell us the Big Bang is how it happened, all right? I'm not saying that is how it happened. It's just a theory out there. But going along with that just for a moment, following me, let's just see what the theory more or less is. Um, and to do that, I've got one picture that I'd like to show up there. All right, now the picture basically shows... Um, the Earth today and the far side there at 13.8 billion uh, years since, since the universe started, not the Earth. Um, and then what it shows is basically the history of the, of the universe, the universe getting bigger with time. So the idea is the universe is expanding over time, but that it started all the way on the left with a big bang. And what we see as we move across is the age of the universe. Now, a number of things blew my mind as I, as I looked at this, um, at this picture. One is, firstly, just how old everything is, which for me is similar to how big everything is. It's just God's extravagance. Like, he's outside of time, so it wasn't as if he was sitting around getting bored. Um, but there's an extravagance in, in, in where we've got to today. Um, but then, it's, it's, what blew my mind is you've got 13.8 billion years across there, but when you start moving towards the start, towards the beginning... The, the epochs, the time phases become very short. You've got like three minutes is the third one. The, the, the size of the universe at three minutes. Then you've got the size of the universe at one microsecond, second from the left. And then you've got the size of the universe during the period that they call inflation, which is uh, at 10 to the minus 32 seconds. They estimate that's how big it was. And like what's happening at each stage, like you know, during the first microsecond, neutrons, protons, and electrons are formed. Um, I couldn't believe just how, like, how quickly things happen initially relative to the, the billions of years of expansion, according to this theory. And, uh, yeah, anyone know what a microsecond is? How long is a microsecond? It's, um, I'm, I think a split second is, is longer than that. I think a split second is like a tenth of a second or something. 10 to the minus 3, is it? Is it? Okay, could be. It's not going to change my... I heard it was a millionth of, the sec of a second. But you're saying you're fairly sure it was... I thought I read a millionth, but so <laughs> maybe it's a thousandth. Okay. It's either a thousandth or a millionth, my, but my point doesn't stand to fall on that. The point is it's, it's not a long time, all right? <laughs> it's, it's, 
It's either a thousandth or a millionth of a second, and that's the second phase, right? The first phase is at 10 to the minus 32. I don't know if that's a septillionth or whatever, but, um, but the point is um, that so much happened. Like, the universe at the second block there, it's like almost a third of the size, roughly a third of its current size. So it's already Louis Giglio big. Like, it's like you really had your mind blown just, you know, looking at how big it is after a microsecond. So the idea is that the universe expanded way, 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 way infinitely faster than the speed of light, which is difficult to get your head around. But for me, it sounds very much like God just saying, let it happen. Because it's such an instant. The idea is it's gone from something infinitesimally small. So the idea is it started infin infinitely small, like way, way, way smaller than a grain of sand, and became madly huge within a microsecond. I think that looks like creation. I don't know. Like, I, I, in the, the fact that there's sort of scientific theories that could explain that, that, that is just like, oh, wow, like actually creation is perhaps real. Like God just said, like, let it happen, and there it is. Massive, like way, way huge, just in an, in an instant, literally an instant for all intents and purposes, whether it's a thousandth or a millionth. It's an instant from nothing to extraordinarily huge, like way huge, bigger than our galaxy or, or, or Milky Way or anything like that in an instant. I don't know. I thought that was epic. And then that still doesn't answer the question of why did it happen and what was before that and where did that infinitely small thing come from, I don't know, guys. I, I just think the more we look at science, the more we look at the universe, it's mind-blowing, and maybe the Big Bang Theory will turn out one day to be wrong, but however it happens, like, God, it's just incredible how huge and wise and epic he is, um, and as we look at the universe, it turns us to worship, um, which is what we see in Psalm 19. So back to the psalm from that, uh, that risky tangent on the Big Bang. <laughs> All right. All right. So back to the psalm, something we know for sure is definitely God's word. Um, psalm 19 um, and, and the next little section, verses 4 and six, four to 6, um, we read about the sun. So more about the sun. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. Now, if you have a pen with you, uh, you can just scratch out verse 6, guys, because now we know from science that the, the sun does not rise at one side and go to the other. We actually know, like, the earth is orbiting around the sun. <laughs> so you can just scratch that one out. Science has disproved the fact. No, guys, don't. <laughs> Don't scratch that out, guys. This is poetry. This is poetry. And, and even we talk like that, and we know about orbits. So David didn't know that the earth was orbiting the sun. We know that, but we still say the, the sun rose there, and it's going down over there, and where is it in the sky now? Um, and it's moved across, and you can see it move down as it sets. Like, we still speak like that, and we know. So how much more is David allowed to use poetry to describe um, the sun, um, and it is beautiful. And, and, and but for me, the idea that we now know about orbits, that like that gives us a whole new level of marvel. I don't know. Orbits is, gets me. I, it, like maybe there's some scientists. Maybe it's that I'm not a scientist, and that's why it blows my mind a bit more. But for me, the idea of an orbit is pretty epic. That that the uh, that if you take the moon, like it's which also has a key role to play in in the Earth. That it's, that it's moving, that there's just enough gravity that it doesn't fl float away from us, but it has just enough momentum um, that it keeps coming back. So, so, sorry, just enough gravity to, to, so that it doesn't fall away, just enough momentum that it doesn't fall into the Earth. Like, it's at just the right balance, and the Earth is at just the right balance relative to the sun, that we don't drift off and freeze to death, that we don't fall in and burn to death, like, we just keep going, and, and that it just keeps on for so, so long. I, I find that incredible. Um, yeah, it, it feels like not a coincidence um, that it works that way. And then, not only is the Earth orbiting around the sun at just the right distance, um, just in terms of heat and conditions for life, 
but we're also spinning. And we're spinning 360 times a year, giving us days and nights. And we're spinning at just the right pace, because if we were spinning any slower, we might uh, freeze. Of if, if, if the days were 10 times lo longer, we would heat up in the day to a point that we wouldn't be able to tolerate. We might freeze at night to, a, to an intolerable level. So we're turning at just the right uh, pace, and we tilt it at, a, at just an interesting angle to give us four beautiful seasons. So the whole way in which it works is an incredible order to it, and, and it continues reliably so. Um, speaking of God, all of it is reflecting something of God and, and His character and His provision. Now, still on the sun, I just wondered here, when I read about the sun being described as a bridegroom rejoicing to run its course, and of course the sun being the light of the world, I just wondered whether, it's maybe a bit naughty, but I wondered whether there's a bit of an artistic foreshadowing here of Jesus, the light of the world and the true bridegroom the cosmic bridegroom, the, the, the bride, the, the, with the church being the bride. Um, I just wondered about that. But if you, if you accept that, just go with me for a moment. And what if maybe the sun is not merely subtly foreshadowing that? What if the sun is actually uh, const constantly proclaiming that in a thunderously loud voice? And we just don't quite understand everything that creation is saying. I wonder, I wonder. It's, it's possible, I'm not sure. But, and as we indulge in the sun a little more, basking in its, in its warmth, um, think about just how reliable and effective the sun is. The, the, the psalm says nothing is deprived of its warmth. It, it doesn't need any maintenance. There's no load shedding of the sun. <laughs> like, <laughs> I know we're enjoying bottomless electricity right now, but, but the sun just goes on and on. All right, the sun, like we need, we create things through our own ingenuity, but it needs maintenance. Sometimes it breaks down. It can't completely be relied on. But the sun just goes on and on and on, needs no maintenance. It's, it's incredible. Again, reflecting something of God um, and his perfection. So as we conclude thinking about the message of creation, I want to get a bit of congregational participation going. Um, just shout out from where you're sitting, Anything you think creation says about God, about his nature, or by his character? I've said a few things, but anything else. Could be one word, could be a short phrase. Consistency. Consistency. Majestic. Majestic. What else? Everlasting. Beautiful, everlasting, intentional, self-sustaining, I love it. Powerful. Powerful. Precise. Precise. I love it. Okay, there's a lot we could go on uh, reflecting on what creation is saying about, about who God is. So we see from creation, firstly, that there is a creator, and we can discern aspects of his nature and even his character, and that should lead us to worshiping him. We see from nature aspects of his, of his nature and character. Romans 1 verse 20 puts it this way. Romans 1 verse 20 says, For since the creation of the world... God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. There's an interesting twist though at the end. <laughs> men are without excuse. It's actually kind of scary this, because we all know enough about God to be without excuse. We all know enough from his general revelation in creation to be without excuse. Psalm 19 says its voice goes out to all the earth and its words to the ends of the earth. So everyone sees creation. Everyone hears its voice. But are we given a name for God in creation? Are, are we given a, a way to be saved? Are we taught uh, about uh, an assurance that we will one day be, ra be raised from the dead and enjoy eternal life? I don't think we, we, we're given that kind of information through creation. And if we are, it's because we don't know how to, how to interpret it. We don't, we don't have the, the way to translate that message from creation. No, for this we need God's special revelation in his word. 
His general revelation tells us about that he exists, about his nature, something about his character perhaps, but not uh, enough, not enough, and we need more. We need his special revelation. We need uh, Amos 5 verse 8. Amos 5 verse 8 says that he who made Pleiades and Orion, which I think is star constellations, he who made the Pleiades and Orion, he who turns midnight into dawn and darkens the day into night, he who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the land, the Lord is his name. Yahweh is his name. We need the word to tell us that. Um, A guy called Justin Taylor, who isn't a relative of mine, um, he describes God's general revelation and his special revelation uh, like this. He writes, both general and special revelation are sufficient, but for different things. General revelation is sufficient to condemn us, but it is not sufficient to save us. Only special revelation is sufficient to save, since through it alone, God causes the new birth. He has caused us to be born again through the living and abiding word of God. Yeah, we need, as Psalm 19 verse 7 says, we need the perfect law of the word, of the Lord. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Only his perfect Law is able to revive our soul, renew our soul, or some translations even say convert the soul. And only his trustworthy statutes are able to make wise the simple and even wise to the point of salvation. And here I'm kind of blending and paraphrasing the psalm and 2 Timothy 3, which says that the scriptures are able to make us wise for salvation through Jesus Christ. I like, I like the older versions which say wise unto salvation. Um, is a type of wisdom that that is in the scripture through which we can be saved. Um, And we need this wisdom, we need this revelation uh, to be saved, to know his name, to know him. Uh, We need his special revelation of himself through his word. And that's where David turns next in in Psalm 19, verse 7 to 11. And I want us to notice three things about his meditation on God's word. Three things. One is God's word is effective. Secondly, God's word is so, so good. And thirdly, God's word must be obeyed. God's word is effective. It's so, so good, and it must be obeyed. So let's read verse 7 and 8 now. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart, The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Did you see how many doing words there are? Words that end with I-N-G. We've got reviving, making wise, giving joy, giving light. It's interesting here, you've got, in each of these uh, verses, you've got the same parallelism. You've got a a, a, a same pattern. You've got a, a name for the word, like the law, or the statutes, precepts, or commands kind of synonyms almost for God's word or that draw out different aspects of God's word. Then you've got a description of God's word. So the law is perfect. The statutes are trustworthy. The precepts are right. Commands are radiant. And then you've got what it does. It revives the soul. It makes wise the simple. Gives joy to the heart. It gives light to the eyes. So it's effective. It does stuff. God's word makes the change. Hebrews says that the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword, and it pierces into our hearts. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts, changes us. And now we've got many reasons to believe that the Bible is, in fact, God's word. Like, it's all inspired by him. It's perfect. It's inerrant. Um, and, And we have many reasons why we believe that doctrine. But one of the reasons, maybe my favorite reason, is, is that there's an experiential testimony that we have when we read God's word. And maybe non-Christians out there might feel like this is a circular argument, this is kind of like not, this is kind of cheating, but I think it's totally legit that, that God's word testifies to its own authenticity as we read it, as we experience something happen. Um, it changes us, it convinces us and convicts us in ways that other authors fail to do. 
like we read beautiful things out there and someone might say something we really agree with and we feel like, mm, that's good, but it's still different to that conviction and convincing that we get when we read the word. We realize that it actually has authority over our lives. And it actually does revive us. It actually does restore us. It gives us joy. It gives us light. It gives us hope. It gives us peace and understanding and direction for our lives. God's word accomplishes its purpose. It is effective. It accomplishes its purpose. Isaiah 55 puts it this way, that as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish and so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God's word is effective. It works. And many of your lives testify to that. Amen. And so that's why at Rooted Fellowship, we preach the Bible. That's the core of how we do things. We are gospel-centered church. We preach the Bible week after week. And we don't just give you our ideas kind of substantiated by verses that we've picked out here and there to support our ideas. But we place ourselves under the authority of Scripture. And we aim to understand what Scripture says and what God by Spirit is inspired through his Scripture, what God wants us to hear, and explain that to you and submit our lives to that. That's why we do it. And it is tempting in the ministry and in churches to want to force things, to want to make things happen through, through other ways, um, through other things that might seem effective, maybe through new strategies, new programs, uh, being more culturally relevant. Now, those are all good things. And, and we, we try to do those things. We, we think about programs and strategies, and we certainly want to engage with culture. Those are good things. But the thing that's really going to make a difference in transforming lives is the Word of God. Yeah. It is the Word of God. Absolutely. In medicine, and we might have some doctors around in the room, you've got this idea of an active ingredient, all right, where you have maybe like Panada is a brand, but the active ingredient is paracetamol. And you can have different vehicles or packages for different medicines, but the key thing is, does it have that active ingredient? That thing which is actually going to create a physiological change um, in you. And, and in ministry, God's word is the active ingredient. That you can have different vehicles, you can have different programs, different packaging, different ways of structuring it, but the active ingredient must be there. We have to make sure that everything is packed and loaded with the active ingredient, with that thing that makes the change. God's word is what is effective in ministry, and it's going to be what's effective in our own lives individually. We have to believe that. We really have to be convicted that God's word is the thing that changes us, that was the thing to be relied on. And we have to structure our lives around it so that it is our staple diet, so that we're getting lots of it in, we're meditating on it, we're internalizing it, we're remembering it, we're learning from it, we're responding to it. We have to do that. And you can do it in various ways. You can read the Bible in the morning or the evening. You can have one-on-one -on -one discipleship where you read the Bible together. You can have groups of three or four. You can do Wednesday night family group where you get around the Word, or it can be on a Friday night. There's different ways of doing it. But make sure that at its core and, and in front and center is the active ingredient, God's Word, that that's the thing that's going to power your own lives, going to power us as a church going forward. So get it in, in a variety of ways. Maybe use different packaging, different types of, of, of medicines for this. So read the word. Listen to the word. Um, we recently, some of you might be using the Dwell app, so you can listen to the word. Um, you can get it at church preached live. You can listen to podcasts. You can write the word out. Um, you can rewrite it in your own words. Uh, you can memorize it. Guys, memorizing the word is a, it's a really good practice that, that I, I probably need to do more of, and I think we maybe tend to neglect these days. But memorizing it as a way of internalizing it. Preaching it to yourself. Declaring it to yourself that it's true. These are all different ways. Teaching it to others is a great way to learn it for yourself. Um, because God's word is effective. But we see not only that God's word is effective, but it's just so, so good. David just enjoys it. He says, it is more precious than gold, than much pure gold. He says, sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. 
He loves it. This reminds us of the very first psalm in this series, Psalm 1, um, where Pastor Arne took us through it, and he said, we saw that blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. He delights in it. It's a joy. It's so, so good. He meditates on it day and night. And this idea of meditation uh, is a great Christian concept, not of emptying your mind of things, but of filling your mind with the word, filling your mind with truth, um, and chewing on it. Like meditating has this idea of chewing on, like going over and over, and chewing on it, enjoying it, like savoring it, um, drinking it in, enjoying the taste. It is a feast. And if, if, if maybe, I don't know if you guys have been on those like Christian camps, we haven't done one for a while like that at Rooted, where you get like maybe a guest speaker and you spend three or four days going through a book, and it's just a feast. When, it, when the word is beautifully unpacked like that and you spend lots of time in it discussing it, it is a feast. It is to be enjoyed and savored. But loving and delighting the word goes further than merely finding it interesting or beautiful. It's not a spectator sport where you can just admire it from a distance. Um, no, valuing and loving the word is about believing it and it's about obeying it. It can't just be like an academic thing that you, you study and enjoy. You have to believe it and you have to obey it. And that's where David goes next. That's the third thing we see about his meditation on the word is that it has to be obeyed. Um, as we look at, at uh, verses 7 to 11 and we see how they end, we see that at the end of the meditation on the word, David writes, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there's great reward. So the reward comes from keeping God's word, not just from looking at it as we would look at other poetry, but from keeping it. And, and it, it came up earlier actually as well in verse 9, where it talks about the fear of the Lord. Now, I've highlighted the, the fear in a slightly different color because when I first read the fear of the Lord at this point, I wondered, is, it felt like a little out of place because we're seeing all these synonyms for, for God's word. We're seeing the law, statutes, precepts, commands, and decrees, and there in the middle is the fear of the Lord. Like if we took this verse out of context on its own and put it on a fridge about the fear of the Lord um, is pure and during forever, we would just think about uh, what it means to fear God and how that's a good thing. But the fact that it's here, the structure actually gives us a clue. Like David's using it kind of synonymously with the word. It's almost using the fear of the Lord as another name or way to describe God's word, which I think is interesting to think it through and to think, what, is that, what does that tell us? Um, I think it tells us that intrinsic to God's revelation of himself and intrinsic to what's in the word is, is a fear of the Lord. Like it's, you can't have his revelation of himself without an, an, a necessary response, without a view of God. And it, and it models for us who he is, like, and who he is is fearful. So I just think there's something to be, to be kind of meditated on there that he actually uses the fear of the Lord as almost one of the names of the word, almost synonymously with the word. Um, because God's word and his revelation of himself, both in nature and in his word, it demands an appropriate response. It demands a, a posture in response. And that's how David ends the psalm. The, the, the last few verses of the psalm, the third section of the psalm is about his appropriate response that he models for us, where he's considered God in his creation. He's seen God revealed in his word as well. And his response is the right response it's interesting that his response here is the opposite to this, the rebellious and foolish response that humanity has had to God. Uh, we read a bit of Romans chapter 1 earlier, and I want to, I want to carry on reading that, uh, where we read that, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. You remember Psalm 14, Wade took us through it a few weeks ago, where we saw that God looked around, we, sorry, we saw that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. We, we said it's foolish to say there's no God. And we see that here as we read further in Romans, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. 
and exchange the glory of God for, immort- for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. So there's a, there's a rebellious and foolish response to God's revelation. But in contrast, David, uh, when he sees God's revelation, he's immediately aware of his own sinfulness. And he adopts a posture of humility and confession. Let's read the last three verses, 12 to 14 together. David asks, who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's the appropriate response to God's incredible revelation of himself. It's a a response of humility, but often when, what's interesting in the Bible is that when God reveals himself, there's also often an intense awareness of our own sinfulness. Clarinda read from Isaiah earlier, where he was in the throne room of God, and he saw God high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And, and Isaiah's response was, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. So, so it's almost like you see God's like, but I, I'm sinful, like I can't stand in his presence. And, and that's kind of part of what the response we see here from David to God's revelation. Now, David was an expert on sin. <laughs> All right, he was an expert on sin in different ways. Firstly, because he sinned a lot <laughs> and in different ways and in horrendous ways. But also he was great at confession and he modeled for us like how to confess in, and he understood sin. And, and here in, in this um, passage, it's, it's like he also recognizes a few different categories of sin or aspects of our sin. The easy one is the one we're most aware of, what he refers to as willful sins, um, sometimes translated as presumptuous sins or insolent sins or arrogant sins. Um, this is us at our rebellious worst. This is when we know exactly what we're doing we know it's wrong, and we do it anyway, and we do it again. That, that, that's our willful sins, and we all, we all do that. Um, and David prays, keep me from them. Keep me from them. May they not rule over me. But he also prays for forgiveness. And this reminds me of the Lord's Prayer, we, where we are taught to pray, forgive us our sins, and we're also taught to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And it's the same thing here, and I think it's not a coincidence that we see the same pattern of praying for forgiveness uh, and, and for repentance in both the Psalms and the Lord's Prayer, because both are given to us by God to teach us to pray. So no coincidence there. But I want to focus a little bit more now on, on the other category of sin that David refers to as hidden error or hidden faults. Um, and he asks a question. He says, who can discern his errors? And it's a rhetorical question where the answer clearly is no one. No one can actually discern the errors, is, is the meaning David has in mind here. So he's referring to a, ty- a category of sin or an aspect of our sin that is so deeply embedded in us. Um, it's so thick that we kind of can't see through it. And we, we don't even know it's there. That maybe even in our good, the, th- the good things we're doing, we may be riddled with wrong motives or pride. Um, that we don't fully know how deeply corrupted we are. We saw that a few weeks ago as well, how everything has become corrupted. And we, like it goes really deep and our sinfulness is, is really thick um, and complicated and we don't fully understand it. Often we don't even see it at all. I, I have a feeling that these kinds of hidden errors, these hidden faults are often what's going on when we're really angry. They're fueling that. Um, in our conflicts, uh, when we feel offended. In in a lot of those situations, I I think there's things we believe in which which are lies that we don't really understand or pride or offenses. It's those hidden sins that we need need God's grace to forgive those as well. Um, And so, yeah, our sinfulness is really really deep. It goes from rebellious and willful all the way to hidden and we don't even understand how sinful we are. But... There's hope. There's hope because David prays, forgive my hidden faults. 
And I really like the way the, the English Standard Version translates this. It says, declare me innocent of hidden faults. A somewhat more literal translation. Declare me innocent of hidden faults. I like it because I think it kind of explains how God's forgiveness works. Um, God doesn't just kind of forgive and forget or kind of ignore our sin or sweep it under the carpet. It's interesting here that he, de- he forgives us by declaring us innocent. He declares us innocent. And, and yes, God, God forgives us on the basis of Jesus dying in our place um, as a sacrificial death on our behalf. But I didn't come up with that idea, and, and no third person arbiter of the universe told God they have to, they have to regard Jesus' death as, as sufficient for my sin. God chose to do that. And it's only because him in his authority and sovereignty, because he cho- chose to declare us innocent on the basis of that, that we are declared innocent. If it's also the power of his word again that he declares us innocent. He chooses to view us now with the righteousness of Christ. That's his sovereign choice. And if he chooses that, it's objective reality. Because what is objective reality in in life? It is what God says. His, His kind of subjective truth is objective truth. And if God has said it, then it's true. And just think about how epic that is, that God has declared us innocent. Like, we owe nothing. We perfectly cleansed. We actually made perfect in Christ. Um, Yeah, interpersonally, when we forgive each other, like, I might forgive Kenny for doing something to me. Um, But if if Kenny did something and it was a criminal offense, uh, Kenny could still be dragged to court and found guilty, even if I've forgiven Kenny. He's still guilty. But God, if God declares us innocent, then we're innocent. And nobody can can still bring a charge against us. There's a subtle difference there, like an understanding that God has actually made us innocent. So yes, our sin is hectic and it's bad, but like we're actually totally, we're declared innocent and we are perfect in Christ. It's not as if we walk around as like just horrible people with like, God is just kind of like, we're just indebted to him now in kind of a slave relationship to God because of how he's forgiven us and how much we owe him. Like he's actually declared us innocent. We now have the full rights as sons and daughters of God. And we can stand on that and enjoy it and be free to enjoy it. We're no longer guilty. No one can bring a charge, not Satan, not anyone else, uh, because God has declared us innocent. It's our objective reality. See, the gospel is so great. It takes us deep, deep into sin. Like we realize our sin is way worse than we ever knew. But it shows us a bigger and bigger picture of God's grace and of our new identity in him and of the inheritance that is in store for us, um, won and purchased through what Jesus has done on the cross. And if you've studied the gospel-centered life in discipleship groups, you'll know that idea of that the bigger our view of our sin and the bigger our view of what God has done for us and our new identity, the bigger our view of the cross because the cross is where the two are linked, where God exchanges our sin for his righteousness. And it just gives us a bigger, bigger view of Jesus himself. And, and that's where the psalm ends, that Jesus is our redeemer. Well, the psalmist ends by saying, David says, he relies on God, our rock, his rock and his redeemer. Ultimately, he knows that it's God who will redeem him from his sin. It's not his own efforts uh, or anything else, but it's God who is his redeemer. And I want to end by reading a little bit about Jesus, because obviously we know Jesus is our redeemer. God sent Jesus to redeem the world. Um, And in some ways, Jesus is also like a third and even greater revelation of God himself. Like we've seen God revealed in creation. We've seen God revealed in his word. And then God reveals himself by becoming a man and showing us himself through Jesus. And so I want to read now from John chapter 1, just a few verses and I almost want to let it kind of preach for itself. I might be tempted to double click on one or two things. But just listen to how John introduces Jesus. And listen to it kind of in light of God's revelation of himself, of God the creator, uh, of God in it, revealing himself through his word. We read in John chapter 1, uh, and the band can come up uh, at this time, by the way. Um, we read that in the beginning was the word. The beginning was the word, and John's, it'll become clear John's speaking about Jesus. 
Jesus is described as the Word, God's revelation of himself. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. This is Jesus. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. A few verses later in verse 14, John writes that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 16, out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. So in conclusion, God has revealed himself. And the question is, how will we respond? God has revealed himself. How will we respond? And as we think about how to respond, there's some homework to do because you need to get out into creation. Go and explore the mountains. Probably get out of Gauteng, to be honest. Go and see the mountains, see the sea, somewhere we can actually see the stars at night um, brightly. And go and meditate on Psalm 19. The other homework is to get stuck into the Word. Um, This has to be experienced yourself. Get stuck into the Word. Make it uh, central every day, every week. Get into rhythms of, of, of getting the Word in in different formats. An obvious response is to respond with praise and worship. The Psalm 19 is a hymn of praise. It is a hymn of praising God. Um, as he reveals himself and for how he's revealed himself. So praise and worship, we're gonna sing in response now. You may also need to respond by confessing. That's how David responds, with, with confession. So make use of the prayer areas to both sides today. There'll be people to pray with you. Confess to sin. Um, it's part of a right response to, to seeing God for who he is. It might also be to place your trust in Jesus. He is our rock and our redeemer. Place your trust in him today and in his promise to declare you innocent. No matter what you've done, God is powerful enough and his word is powerful enough to declare you innocent. And lastly, you might wanna respond by committing, by making commitments to pray, keep me Father, from willful sins make my thoughts and my words pleasing in your sight. In some way, you may want to respond with a commitment in terms of how you're going to live your life in view of God. So let's pray. Let's stand. Let's stand together and and pray, and then we'll sing together. Father God, we want to thank you this morning and we want to praise you for revealing yourself to us. Lord, you've, you've shown yourself to us. We didn't deserve it, but you have shown us yourself and you've done so abundantly, majestically, beautifully. We thank you for your creation. We thank you for your word. And we thank you for Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, this morning that you would help us to have a right response. Right now, response to what we've heard as we sing, but Lord, as we leave here today, may we respond with lives that bring you honor, may we respond with repentance, with faith, with words and thoughts of praise, words and thoughts that are pleasing to you, Lord. May our whole lives be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock 